Welcome to Your AHA Life. I'm your host, Dr. Tanya Harris Cornelius. The AHA Life is a life of more joy, more purpose, and more fulfillment. Through these episodes, I will bring you stories of insight and inspiration to help you live the life that you dream about, the life that you are meant to live, your AHA life. Enjoy the episode. Well, hello, I am Tanya. Welcome back to Your AHA Life. I have with me Sadeshna Sin today. We're gonna have a great conversation and we're talking about moving from scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. And so I'm so thrilled uh, to welcome Sadeshna to Your AHA Life uh, today. Hi Sadeshna, how are you? I'm good, thanks for having me, Tonya. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. I love the topic that we're talking about um, because it's so important for, you know, that transformation from thinking of things from scarcity uh, to abundance. Um, So before we jump into the topic, let me uh, share a little bit of your bio with our listeners and viewers, and uh, then we'll jump into the conversation. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, so Sadeshna Sin is the founder of the Abundance Psyche. She is a career strategist and a personal development geek, kind of like me. Um, And Sadeshna also has a real-time job in corporate where she works in data scientists. She works in data science. And much of what Sadeshna talks about is from her own experience in navigating her career, which that's what I'm really excited about, Sadeshna. Sometimes we, we um, I have conversations with people who are kind of the, you know, further removed from their career, or maybe they're coaching other people, or they're kind of the experts. You are coming with your own personal experience, which I think um, is going to really resonate with um, our viewers and, and listeners of, of your AHA life. So I, I love that. Um, you also uh, are going to be sharing things about what you have witnessed and observed uh, in the careers of those that you teach, your students, as well as your clients. And um, what I also really love is that you bring a spiritual uh, component to all that you do, and it's the practical uh, spiritual component in what you teach. And so that's a little bit about Sadeshna. Sadeshna, I'm going to give you an opportunity to share a little bit more on your journey, your personal, professional journey, wherever you'd like to go with it. Sure. Thanks, Tonya. So about me, I currently head up a data science team in a top events company. Um, My professional background is that I spent most of my career in uh, strategy and management consulting, which are very high profile jobs in some ways. Um, And uh, that's what I've been doing all my career. I moved to London about six years or so back. um, And I moved from Mumbai in India to London. So, you know, this, this was about six years or so back I still remember it was the 23rd of September 2013 and I uh, was filled with self-doubt when I was making that move because in my head I was moving from the Indian financial capital to perhaps the world's financial capital right so big expectations big dreams but also I was convinced that uh, no one wanted to hire me because you know, uh, everyone I knew who had made a similar move, they took at least two to three years or so to find a job that they really liked. But uh, funnily enough, I actually ended up finding multiple top jobs um, within three months of me being here. So that was the Christmas of 20. 14, so I moved uh, 2014 September and by Christmas of 2014 I had like four job offers and I was at the point when where I was like okay I cannot interview anymore because you know I have to now start choosing and figuring out all of this stuff. Yeah um, you know by the way Sadeshna that's a good problem to have you know that you have so many offers 
um, that you get a you get an opportunity to choose. So many people, as you said, you know, sometimes are waiting for that offer. So you were able to have multiple offers to consider. That's that's right. And I should have commended myself on it. But you know what? Um, people around me say that, oh, well, you see, she's lucky. So she got these many jobs. And I, I was always in self-doubt. So I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, of course I was lucky. I mean, what else could it be, right? Of course I was lucky. And that's why I ended up getting multiple job offers. Um, and then I started working at this job. Um, and I s kind of bombed the first two projects. And if you are a strategy consultant, you'll know that, you know, we have an up or out system. So if you oh. bomb up projects, you are in serious trouble. Um, but I actually did not do very well in those first two projects. And I was, again, filled with self-doubt. And I was like, yeah, I don't belong here and so on and so forth. But um, then I started sort of um, talking to a lot of people because I, I was I was crying myself. Uh, I was traveling Monday to Thursday. I was crying myself to sleep in hotel rooms in like God knows where in the country that is. And like people think consulting is great for travels, but you know, you at times end up traveling to like these remote places out of nowhere. So I was basically stranded in the midst of nowhere, crying myself to sleep every other night. And I was like, okay, why am I doing this? Like, this is supposed to be the job that people are uh, gonna trade an arm and a leg for, but mm -hmm. I'm not happy, why is that? And I'm, I'm not as talented as my coworkers and so on. Um, but then the overachiever in me sort of did not want to give up. So I basically was like, okay, so we can't give up. We have to figure out a route. Um, so I started talking to everyone that I could. I found mentors, I got coaches, I did like tons and tons of professional development courses, personal development courses, I bought books, so did it all. And then I suddenly started discovering that this thing that I had considered as luck was actually something that I hadn't observed in myself. So, you know, I, so I never told myself the less glamorous part of the story and I never told others the less glamorous part of the story. So remember 23rd of September, 2014, I had landed in London. From 24th of September morning, 9 a.m., I started applying to jobs. That was the level of commitment that I had and that was the level of commitment I had put in for almost all my career when I was uh, looking for a job out of university, when I was putting together my resume, when I wanted to figure out what is it that I want to do in life. So I was lucky, of course, I was born to the right set of parents. You know, I, I, I was, I was, I'm lucky in so many ways and let's not even second guess that. But there are some things like your career decisions that I think I put a lot of time, effort, energy into. And uh, to just say that I, oh, I was lucky would be lying. And yeah. that's when I sort of figured out that, yeah, what people were calling luck and I was imagining as luck was actually a lot of hard work. And then I started kind of discovering the systems, processes that had put in place. And that's what I basically share on the Abundant Psyche these days. So, yeah, yeah. we're going to we're going to talk in, in just a few minutes about the Abundant Psyche, what it is and, and what you share with uh, with your students and, and clients about that. But I your story is so interesting, Sadeshna, because here you were, you were very successful in Mumbai, here in India, um, kind of, you know, uh, very much. Uh, um, at home in the culture there, and then you uprooted to the UK. Uh, and I like what you said, you kind of moved to the, perhaps the, the global financial center. So the stage was a big stage. And it's so often when I talk to people or maybe when you do as well, and they get a new promotion or like you, they move to somewhere else. Instead of 
um, instead of it immediately being um, trusting the track record that got you there, what what ends up happening is you kind of forget all your success and the self-doubt creeps in. And so that's what I heard you say about when you came to the UK, when you got there, um, even though you were able to find a job really quickly, so that should have been, you know, flag number one that, hey, you are, you, you have what it takes, but you didn't believe in it initially until, um, until after a little while. So I do, I also heard you say, which was also interesting to me, was that, um, and thank you for sharing, because that's a vulnerable side, that your first two projects on the job didn't go well. And, um, and I think that's something else that we, you know, sometimes um, ignore is that there is just as much to learn uh, from not succeeding sometimes and, and having some failures as it is to learn from our own successes. Because I think it's, it was through your failures, right, that you kind of gathered yourself and say, wait a minute, you know, I've been successful before. And so what, what was I doing when I was successful? So I know I, I, I want to hear more from you, but I just captured those thoughts as you were talking and, and just really, really um, listening to your, your journey from, from uh, India to the UK and all that you went through. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my move from India to the UK was obviously moving from uh, Mumbai, which is, uh, it is the Indian financial capital, India, it, it's the Indian melting pot of talent, literally, mm-hmm. um, to London, where, you know, it's the global, uh, so in London and New York, I would say, if yeah. you are someone who's working in banking and finance, which is something that I used to cater to when I was in consulting, and in fact, uh, still now, I think most of my clients are uh, in banking and finance anyway. Um, so when you are making that sort of a move, you always are kind of second guessing yourself. Am I really good enough for the world stage? Um, that, and I also have to add that the fact that um, we have this colonial history and there is no denying that, you know, the impact that that colonial history has on your culture, how much ever liberal you are, how much ever educated you are, when you have been brought up thinking that, you know, um, these guys uh, had, the, the British Empire was there for about 200 years in India. And all of that cultural context also kind of, put some sort of a self-doubt on you and especially as someone who uh, moved here who wasn't born here so I do not know the culture that's here I didn't realize or understand um, British humor other than the fact that I had watched movies or read in books Uh, I did not so uh, in in England like there's there's a I, I I love the British culture, <laughs> but you know, uh, people are generally very polite, and at times it's really difficult as someone who comes from another country to pick up on what's polite and actually it's passive aggressive. So mm-hmm. like, so there there are these cultural nuances that you have to figure out, and you you need to be here for some time to figure all of that out. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the first comment. I think when you are moving countries, continents, I suppose even cities for that matter, like you have to allow yourself the grace to uh, settle down. Yeah. A bit. Yeah. You need to be loving towards your own self. Otherwise it's just a bit too overwhelming. Yeah, and and just even just company to company, because different companies have different um, company cultures too, corporate cultures as well. So you were dealing with a lot. You had you 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 made a big geographical move. You had uh, societally cultural changes uh, to navigate, 
And then you were working for uh, a company where you had to adjust to that company's culture as well uh, on top of learning your job. So there was a lot going on there. So it, it's, it's understandable that you would like, you know, have a little bit of a moment of, oh, how am I going to fit in here? Um, but you said that, yeah, you started with some self-doubt and you heard people say you were lucky and you bought into it for a while until you said, no, this is not luck. This, I work hard for this. What, yeah. what brought that about? What brought about you rejecting the fact that it's just, it was just luck and it was more about your hard work? Right. So, you know, the first couple of projects that I spoke about that I didn't do very well on. So till that point, I think almost 100% of my clients had been in banking and finance. The first two projects I did uh, when I moved to the UK was, um, so was for the health services industry and that to the National Health Services. So UK is really proud of the NHS and the NHS is fantastic. But I had, as someone who was new to the country, I didn't even have a national, um, like I didn't even register for the NHS. Forget having them as my client. So I was kind of a bit in an shock of okay I don't even know this stuff I was hired for uh, something else and I somehow found myself helping the health services which is great uh, because I think I did actually add a lot of value but initially just the fact that I had never worked in this industry I didn't know anything about the health services and so on that that was a bit um uh, interesting, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and and then the other thing that I figured was also the fact that I didn't do well on the projects is probably something that's not true entirely. What I did not do well were some parts of it. So I did really well in the parts that I was brought on to the project for. So for example, data and strategy and all of those bits, I did really, really well. What I didn't do too well on was the communication, the leadership, the softer skills aspect of things. Um, and that was, again, very much to do with the cultural shift and the cultural change piece. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think I kind of, um, while I was getting the feedback, again, the feedback was coming in this form of people being too nice and too polite. And I was like, okay, so I must be doing well. And I was like, uh, well, when you finally look at the feedback or the scorecard that you have at the end of the project, you're like, okay, what went wrong? Yes. I thought I was doing yes. well. Um, so, so those were the sorts of indicators into, well, I, I'm not doing, I'm not completely off. I'm just a bit off. So there must be something going on. And then as I spoke to more and more people, I think um, in this while, I actually saw a career coach and actually a therapist as well, because I was not doing well at all. Uh, one of the things that this therapist lady tells me first session ever, she asks, so you are describing me your professional problems. Who are these people that you are working with? So I was like, what do you mean? So I said, well, I don't know what you mean. And she said, okay, tell me their names. And uh, mm -hmm. I started saying their names and he, she went like, oh, all white men. So I was like, uh, yeah, I had never thought about that, but yeah, that's right. And she was like, so could it be that you are just feeling a bit out of place culturally? Could it be that, you know, um, women generally have a tougher time to break a conversation and kind of say, hey, come on, hear me out and so on. So, and men also tend to at times not notice the subtle cues that someone wants to talk. Um, 
and she she kind of pointed that out to me and i was like okay that was the first moment so when some, i some started cross, some, what i'm hearing is some cross gender communication differences yeah um, as so well as maybe some cultural communication differences right uh, cross gender communication differences cross culture like yes. differences in culture and yeah in general i think it's it's got nothing to do with, well, it has something to do with society, but also, you know, women tend to be a lot less confident than men in most contexts, which is the unfortunate truth. And I wish I was lying, but that's, that's the data says. We definitely that's pay attention to it more. You know, we definitely pay attention to it more. I think men may subtly uh, have confidence issues too, but they mask it way better than than women do. Um, it it really will weigh on us us women because we don't mask it as well. Yeah, that and also I. Um... I, as I got to learn more and more about all of this, I figured out that there are hormonal differences that tend to and lend to confidence triggers. So for example, testosterone as a hormone, which is uh, present more in men, yes. um, actually contributes to confidence, actually oh. contributes to the loudness or the, you know, uh, energy or a different sort of energy it's not it's not the same women are very energetic as well but in very very different ways um and the fact that we have less testosterone also means that we have less confidence um mm. and you will also uh notice those differences during a project where you have all men in a room and the one woman so wow there, I, never, there are. I never heard that i never knew that sudeshana that's that's so interesting of yeah. course i know men have more testosterone of course i know that you know um uh but i didn't know the linkage between testosterone and confidence so that's that's something interesting yeah so there's there's actually been quite a lot of research on this and this is the whole biochemistry piece that I uh, find fascinating, actually. Yeah. The first I heard about it was from this social psychologist lady um, called Amy Cuddy. So she talks a lot about this. And so there's, there's definitely testosterone and uh, the lack of it. But there are also other hormones that you can control in your body in some ways to... Um, appear as more confident and then that the appearance of appearing more confident makes you more confident if that makes sense yeah. it's it's um, so for example the moment your adrenaline goes down so adrenaline is the fight or flight hormone the moment your adrenaline drops uh, what happens is you are calmer the moment you appear calmer you appear more confident just because it feels like you don't need to get to the next flight and go somewhere right um, then your posture so the more balanced you are in your center the more confident you appear and these are very practical you could call it biochemistry you could call it practical spirituality like at the end of the day meditation teaches you all of these things in a very different context. You know, I, I love what, where you're going with this. And um, I know we still haven't even directly talked about abundant psyche yet, but we mm. will. But I, I love where you're going with this because I was in a book club uh, recently inside of my AHA community, um, my Facebook, my private uh, group on Facebook. And we read this, uh, this book by Ryan Holiday, um, Stillness is the Key. And there, he's describing at the very beginning of the book, he's describing uh, John F. Kennedy, um, who I guess there was some, maybe it's, there was the Cuban crisis or 
I forget exactly what, so I'd have to go back and look at it. But it, I, I just, there was a line in the book that said he was the stillest person in the room. And something about that, I felt that energy just reading it. He is being the stillest person in the room. And like you said, when you let your adrenaline kind of go down a little bit and you appear calmer, you actually also then appear more confident. And that's, um, that's something anybody can learn, right? Is you, can, you can recognize when your adrenaline is up, then you can take those deep breaths, like in meditation, you can yeah. take those deep breaths, calm yourself down, get still, and, you know, give this aura, give this, you know, personification that you are the stillest person in the room. I love that. And, and confident. Absolutely. I think that's, that is the practical nature of spirituality. That's, that's what I always tend to say. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's, um, let's go into, cause you're starting to go into that some, some ways. And I want to just take us back to, you know, you had that struggling with self, self-doubt um, that you had been successful where you were. You came to the UK. You uh, didn't meet initially a lot of success, but then you were able to parse out that you, it wasn't all bad. You had some success and, and being able to identify that I think is another great thing is that sometimes we overblow the fact that we think, oh, we're a failure. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you really examine it, um, there might be some things that acts absolutely you need to get better at, but then being able to point out the things that actually work well um, is also good. Um, so you had a turning point you talked to me about. Mm. It was a question that you asked yourself. And uh, yes. I want you to share that uh, with, our, with our listeners. Yeah, so, you know, I started going back to all of this time when I was a student and I was actually starting to uh, do some freelance writing, uh, making money online. And this was far long back, like, you know, online businesses, they are new even now. Yeah. And I'm talking about almost 15 years back. So they wow. were they were new back then yes and um and people wouldn't believe that you could make money online they would think that it's a scam but i somehow managed to make quite a lot of money online back in the day um well when i say a lot i mean by student standards of yes. course not yes. not not by um our standards right now but it was a lot of money when i was a student um and what I wanted to go back to is what was I doing back then that led me to this success or, you know, this amazing career, this, you know, making money online, making a ton of friends, having a yeah. great network and all of those things. What was I doing differently? And it just occurred to me that, you know, when I was 17 or 18 years old, I had very little to lose. So I basically was like, I have nothing to lose if I just did this. Um, and that's what kind of started this revelation of what if I have nothing to lose? I will never lose anything. Yeah. Because I will always survive life. Uh, and I, all, I know how to make money. That's, that's, that's like, you know, even if I don't have this job, I'll find something else. I will not die hungry. I knew that. So I was like, what else do I have to lose? If I have nothing to lose, what am I, what am I so afraid about? And because, that kind you know of... What? Because if you don't have anything to lose, then that means you have everything to everything gain. Everything to gain. Exactly. Wow. Yes. Exactly. That's, that's it. So you basically realize that you are unstoppable. And you realize that, well, if I am not attached to, you know, this title of being a senior consultant in a top firm, or if I'm not attached to my uh, annual salary, or if I'm not attached to this house that I'm living in, 
actually, I don't have anything to lose. I mean, what is mine will always be mine. Um, my talent, my hard work, my work ethics, and all of those things will be mine. So if I don't have anything to lose, I have everything to gain. And that that helps you tap into this enormous abundance in the universe. Yes. So here we are. We're approaching now the abundance psyche, which is so exciting. Before you take us to the abundance psyche, though, let's go to the opposite of the abundance psyche. It's really scarcity, you know, mm. having this scarcity mindset. Um, because you said if, if the, the question that prompted you, this transformation was, you know, what if I have nothing to lose? which mm. opened, opened up the universe to you. But the opposite of that is feeling like you have everything to lose. And so then you just try to play it safe in life, right? And mm. because you're so scared that you're going to lose your, your house or your title or your car or your this or that, you know, whatever those things are. And so, um, and I, you know, so scarcity mindset, you know, share a little bit, about that with me, how you see the scarcity mindset, and then we'll move into abundance psyche. Sure. So I think personally, scarcity is at the root of all our problems. Mm. So today, if I say I don't have enough money, or I don't have enough time, I don't have enough love, uh, all of those are the scarcity of money, the scarcity of time, the scarcity of love, and so on. But if I flip that around and really start asking questions about you don't have enough money, why is it that you don't have enough money? Um, and you can say, well, my bank balance says that I don't have enough money. Okay, fine. But what is money? And then you say, okay, what is money? It, they are banknotes. And you're like, no, banknotes are just a representation of some kind. What is money? Then you get down to money is actually value. Um, so do you think you don't have any value to add to the world or the universe? No, that's not true. Every one of us has some value to add. So then you have some value to add, yes. So if you have some value to add, that means you are worthy of something which is money so you are not poor you have an abundance of money that that just almost like if you just keep questioning on to that scarcity you will realize that there is a logical fallacy of you thinking that the universe is scarce in that particular thing so uh, let's let's try out something what is the uh, what is a problem that you have been having lately or someone you know has been having lately you know um i and that i it may take me a moment to think of that but what i what immediately comes to mind when i think people are experiencing a scarcity mindset is um I, I have two, so I'll do my personal one, but before I do my personal one, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I find a lot, is that people are competitive with another person. Say, they, say they're competing for a promotion or whatever. Um, that's where it comes up for me, like, um, com, you know, this competition with another person it, it kind of signals to me that they think there is a fixed pie. There's a fixed, exactly. um, something is, is fixed uh, and, and that they have to compete for this one thing. And so, yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's something that came. Yeah. That so came so if you, if you think about you, two of two people or five people are competing for the same thing, that means that there is only one thing right to be competing for but if they were all working together they could probably not only 5x the pie they could probably 10x the pie and all of them could um, benefit from that 10x right um, and this is something that i personally see uh, while i'm growing the abundance psyche right now that in the online world i find two sets of people 
one set are the ones who basically want to hold everything close to their chest and say, right. my clients, my, my, uh, you know, my IP, my clients, my methods, my systems. <coughs> and then there are the other set of people who are always sort of wanting to collaborate, jumping into partnerships and so on. And those are the people who are making the big bucks. Why? Yeah. Simply because they have just expanded their pie to be limitless. And that's, that's what I think. The scarcity of promotion is just because you make it out to be a <laughs> scarcity. Actually, if you collaborate and partner up with your co-workers, you'll probably end up um, with a bigger pie than uh, which can afford the uh, promotion of two or even maybe three, four, five people. So, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you, Sudeshna, in that, in that example that I gave, there might be one position today, but that doesn't mean that's the only position ever. And so, um, the scarcity mindset is, is saying, if I don't get this one, then I've lost. The, uh, I would think the abundance mindset says, yeah, I, I want that job, but if it doesn't get, I know there's another job. I know that there's other ways in which I can grow and contribute. To me, that's the, that's the difference, you know, and, and so the, the competitive. So I will give you my personal example because I work a full-time job and then I do this podcast. I, I write for my blog. I, you know, do a lot of other, you know, hobbies type things um, on the side and um, things that I'm very passionate about. And I just feel I'm writing a book, uh, all of these things. And so my, if I were, ha if I were going to have a scarcity mindset would say, I don't have enough time. I bet you hear that a lot. Yes. That time is the scarce commodity or the scarce resource. Okay, I'm going to give you two answers to that. Okay. One is you can always buy back time. And this is something that people don't talk about and people don't, uh, it's not glamorous to talk about. That's why people don't talk about it. But the fact that we are trying to do everything ourselves and be perfectionists about it also means that we are keeping a lot of value that we can offer to the world to ourselves mm. because we just can't be doing it all but you know what like especially when we think about outsourcing uh, like I know I have a lady who has been cleaning uh, doing my cleaning for the last four or five years and uh, she's excellent at that and that's something that I'm completely rubbish at mm -hmm. so so you know if I have a lack of time and I am actually bad at it and my time is better spent somewhere else I can buy back those two hours of Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings right so I think that's one the other concept that I'm going to give you is probably going to be a bit woo-woo out there, okay. but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, so if you think about it, time is just a con construct. We have just made up time to be, well, one year is one earth revolution around the sun. Mm -hmm. One day is one rotation of the earth around its axis so time actually if you think about it in its truest sense is something we have made up and then we try to run this race against time and we will never win so just because we have rigged it in a way that we always will fail so um if we think of ourselves as uh beings in this you know body and mind and all of those things and then we put a construct of time that we have defined ourselves then of course we are running out of time but if we think of ourselves as the universal consciousness 
Um, and this is a heavy thing to digest, but um, if we can somehow figure out the way to thinking of ourselves as the universal consciousness, then you realize that time is just something that is completely made up and we come and go and, you know, the earth always stays where it is, the universe always stays where it is. And anyway, whatever we are doing is just not even a nanosecond in the scale of yeah. earth's timeline or universe's timeline so yeah. why are we getting so attached to it anyway yeah i think i i have read a little bit about that maybe deepak chopra um says something to the same effect and and you know i've learned to say to myself when i think oh i don't have enough time i say to myself you have all the time you need you have all the time you need. So uh, I think just even that, that even that, even that brings my adrenaline down, Sadeshna, and I get, get calm over that. And I say, yes, you're right. Whatever I need, it is there for me. So, you know, I have all the time that, that I need and it's a whole different mindset. So let's go to, let's finally go to the abundant psyche, because I think it is the mindset change, right? So tell yeah. us a little bit about what is the abundant psyche. So the abundant psyche is literally the opposite of scarcity mindset. Like, um, say, for example, like, like we took a few examples, the root of all problems uh, occurs due to the scarcity of something of love, of money, or whatever it is that you are finding scarce in your life at that point in time. However, if we look around the universe, we know, and the universe is not uh, scarce, it's abundant in everything. And if we can figure out a way to tap into that universal abundance, we step into abundance. And that's uh, the psyche that we need to sort of keep developing and questioning ourselves every time we get into this sort of uh, scarcity mindset we need to um, get into asking why is it that I'm feeling this way and how do I step into abundance and when you realize that specific problem that you are dealing with always ask yourself how do I flip it around and how do I tap into abundance? And the more you do that, the more naturally it'll come to you. And you just then become better at spotting abundance. So if you just did it for one whole day, you'll realize by the end of the day how powerful this is. And if you did it for a week, a month, you'll realize that there's abundance everywhere. It's just us not being trained enough in spotting it so yeah. and once you start operating from that sort of a psyche you literally become unstoppable um, and you realize so there's a famous Rumi quote that says the universe is rigged in your favor so that. that 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 is what it is the universe is rigged in your favor and life is happening for you not against you the universe wants to help you and i can keep going back to tons of books and references so uh, i think everyone talks about the alchemist but i i do really like the alchemist it's one of well. my favorite books and it's one of my favorite authors i've probably read more apollo uh, coelho's books than any other author i mean i used to i was on a roll at one time where as soon as i finished reading one of his books i picked up another one and another one and another one but yeah. The Alchemist is definitely, if you ask me my top three books, it's, it's in that. It's in that list. Yeah. 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 And so, he says, so, he says yeah. in there, he says, uh, the universe conspires for your success. So similar exactly. to the Rumi quote that the universe yeah. is rigged in your favor. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what um, I mean by operating from the abundant psyche. And don't get me wrong, it's not an easy practice to develop. But if you are committed to it, 
you do realize that you actually can forever say no to scarcity like i i i don't know i don't know if saying that i can create money on demand i can there is no shortage of money in my life and there never will be how empowering is that like yeah i think that's that's fantastic and and uh, love of course. and time or whatever exactly. it is if you whatever say, it is there is no shortage of love in my life there is no shortage of joy in my life there is no shortage of purpose in my life there's no shortage of time in my life i it just even saying that creates a whole different energy when you say it right absolutely absolutely so so let me get this and let me just kind of repeat this back so um our listeners and viewers get it so the abundance psyche is really just the antithesis of the scarcity mindset the abundance psyche kind of flips the scarcity on its head and challenges the assumption that resources are limited. And the abundant psyche, um, instead of saying resources are limited, the abundant psyche says the universe is plentiful. The universe is infinite. The universe is um, boundless. The universe is abundant right and the universe exists only for you and the universe exists for you yeah ah oh, wow what is that that's worth that's worth waiting for that's worth waiting for in this conversation sudeshna so okay so is it just about stopping midstream and and you know, saying these affirmations or, or whatever, what, what are some of the steps or things that you advise your students that you're teaching your students or, or your clients? Um, how are you training them to know how to flip that on their heads and, and really operate from the abundant psyche? So you know what, I, I will be absolutely honest. It's not something that comes naturally to most people. Mm. But if you think about the spiritual aspect of it, uh, one thing it like the, the fact that the universe is abundant and we have the universe within us is the highest level of spiritual wisdom that I think anyone can get to. Um, and that takes practice. That's not easy. Um, what I do also say is, you know, the moment you start thinking and behaving as if you had as much money as you wanted in your bank or as much time you wanted in your hands, you operate from a whole different level. So, And this is what these manifestation gurus speak about. This is what the... I think they call it the law of abundance. Uh, the, the, there are some abundance gurus out there as well. Uh, but in a sense, what they mean is that, for example, if you say tomorrow want that job of the CEO, um, the fact that you are going on thinking and worrying about it is not going to get you that job. But if you instead start operating from the perspective that, yeah, if I was the CEO of this company today, what would I need done? That gives you a whole different level of purpose, meaning your confidence shows you get better work done. And then guess what? You get noticed. You may or may not become the CEO of the company, but who knows, you might end up uh building a company like that of which you are the ceo and i know this sounds woo but like the, the fact that you are already operating from the place where you want to be is just i don't know you, you just operate at a whole different level and that means that you show up at an interview um knowing that these are the problems that the hiring manager needs to solve and you are solving them for the hiring manager sitting in that interview or say for example you are um 
going out and speaking in a conference in front of 5,000 people. And you, if you know that, yeah, you are this great orator who always like you know has a fun time doing this thing and is super confident and you already you are stepping into that role so to speak so if, yeah. imagine that it's a role and you just step into it what would you do if you were an actor and you were just stepping into that role yeah how would you operate what would yeah. that person be thinking what would that person be doing and the more specific you can get about it the better the results so how would you dress how would you speak how would you carry yourself when would you get up in the morning how long would your commute take how would you be with your um, parents how would you be with your children how would you be with your spouse like all of these things the more specific you get the better it reflects in all of your life so i i love that it's 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 um it's like taking your dream, if you will, I'll use that as an example, and acting as though your dream is already reality. And um, so I want to speak directly to those of you who uh, will watch uh, this podcast and certainly those of you who are listening. Just think about something that you desire um, and you've been dreaming about whether it is to be the CEO of a company, whether it is to be a writer, um, that's one of mine, you know, I'm writing a book. And um, whatever it is, I, I just implore you now to name that thing, name it, and then start acting as though it's already, um, it's already there, you're already living in it. I love what you said, Sudeshna, because it's, you know, down to the details of what time do you get up? I mean, for me, I'll use myself as an example of writing this book, seeing myself as a writer, seeing myself as a published author. So for that to come to pass, the universe has it available to me. So how am I, how am I operating as though I'm, I'm, a published author or I'm I'm going to publish I'm going to be a published author yeah do I what times do I get up do, you know how much time do I spend writing every day what kind of you know uh, resources do I need in terms of an editor or publisher you know just acting just moving about it as though uh, I am I am walking in that abundant dream that I have for myself so that's what I would really, you know, really encourage those of you who get to listen to this and, and watch this is to, is to try that out. Absolutely. Anything else, anything else, Sadeshna? So you get them to really visualize and operate as though that is, if they were the CEO of the company, what would they be doing? How, like I said, what, what time? day would they get up you know what would they what would their day look like what would they do and all of that are there any other you know tips or advice that you give to people to make that transition um, to an abundant psyche so um, what I do also realize that it's something that you cannot live in 24 seven, if you are just getting started on this process, right? Um, and I'll be honest, I, I'm not in that zone 24 seven, like I wish I was, <laughs> I wish I was there two, two hours a day even, but I'm not. Um, and what you do have to do is take that um, spur of motivation yeah. and get really specific and then build it out in your diary, build it out in your uh, reminder system, your uh, people, people use visualization boards and so on. But what I really like to do are diary reminders. So I have a reminder saying, okay, 
is uh, are you doing enough to make this thing come true by this time set realistic goals and then reverse engineer those goals what do i need to be doing ruthless prioritization check in in your diary every so often as to um, am i doing this and also the other thing we forget about diaries is that we create a system and a routine that works for us for some time what we forget to do is to find out another time maybe once in three months or once a quarter um, to actually have a think back about the systems are they still working for us if not what should we do about that yeah so actually so being woo woo is all great and i love it and that's the essence of everything hey However, I love, we, I, just for the record i love woo woo too because what woo woo really gets to is that everything is not explainable with the rationalized mind that there are things that happen that yeah there are things that happen that data science or data it can be very hard and quantitative but there are things in our lives, there are things that happen, there are things that, that we can do that you don't have this finite explanation for. It just is, it's energy. And so I'm really cool with woo woo uh, if it works, you know? So yes. I, I, I'm, I'm okay and, with that. And, and I, you know what, I will add to that, that um, at times it seems inexplicable and unexplained to us with our level of intelligence and consciousness yes however uh, like for example to me abundance this abundance psyche operating from a space of abundance and that creating your reality i have no doubts about it and in my mind it makes absolute logical sense now it might not make sense to someone else if they are at a different level of consciousness so we yes. have to raise our vibrations our consciousness our uh, the whole logical process um so that's that's there and i'm not going to sit and argue with someone who doesn't think that i'm being um logical that's that's fine um yes. but equally i think the laws of the universe are extremely logical and um why while they might not always be explained by our own minds doesn't mean that they can't be explained i mean there are far wiser people than many of us um, yes yeah i'm with this, you on that yeah 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 wow this is good it's a lot to it's a lot to take in but it's so good and and just to realize that we have more working for us than we sometimes realize or or you know even when we realize it tap into it i love what you said you said even you who know the power of this abundant psyche you don't operate in it 24 7 you know that that's a that's a such a high state of consciousness that we don't all we're not always operating from that abundant psyche but i think what i love about it is we can tap into it like if we see ourselves you know limiting ourselves lim having these limiting beliefs about you know our goals and dreams um we can say wait a minute wait a minute and then we can we can tap into you know, the abundant psyche. What if I had nothing to lose? The universe is rigged for in my favor. The universe conspires for my success, that the universe is, is bountiful and, and, and boundless. So I, I love all of that and just being able to, to tap into that. Anything else that you'd like to share before we kind of go into, um, you have something to share with our listeners. So before we go there, anything else you'd like to share? Um, nothing in particular, just know that the universe is rigged in your favor. And also I realize that it's really difficult to operate from the abundant psyche all the time so it is really important to recognize that take the moments of motivation that we have and 
create systems around it. Yeah. Because if we get into the system and habit of actually delivering against our ambitions, our goals, that's what ultimately gets us to success. Yeah. So that's so good. Hey, I'm going to backtrack because I know that after this conversation suggestion, I'm going to be asking myself, well, I didn't ask that question. So I'm going to ask you. So I kind of get it that we don't operate at that highest level of consciousness all the time, but what gets in the way? What gets in the way of us operating at that higher level of consciousness? It's attachment. So, um, so the thing is how much ever we say we are attached to our names are so have you seen people who get upset when their names are mispronounced i have uh, i'm not one of those people because you know hey you call me sudeshna you call me sue you call me no that's not your name that's that's fine by me <laughs> but but people get attached to their names they get attached to the houses they live in their jobs that they are working their monthly salaries um and even people who are not attached to all of these things are really attached to their their family their uh, friends and these are all good attachments to have however attachments get in our way to actually living the limitless so the moment we become someone's friend someone's daughter someone's um, coach someone's mentor those get in the way of your spiritual development and um that's that's what it is unfortunately and that's yeah. why i don't think we can do away with it um immediately most of us can't anyway people who operate at that higher levels of consciousness um, are very rare, therefore. Yeah, I've read a little bit about it. I um, have read some of the kind of the Buddhist principles and, and maybe it's uh, Hindu as well and other Eastern uh, philosophies and, and religions, but this whole notion of attachment, right? And, um, and you know, closely aligned with that is ego. So those things can really um, have us operating in this finite world. Um, and that I think this is why so often, like in, in Buddhist practices, they, you practice this kind of letting go, learning to let go, and um, realizing that at the end of the day, you, you own nothing but everything. It's, it's kind of, that might sound really woo-woo. You talking about woo-woo, that might sound really woo-woo, that you own nothing, but you have everything. But that's that is the, what it is. That's that what is. it is. You're not here to own anything, but you have everything available to you. So, um, so yeah, this, uh, this, um, this idea of uh, being attached, it's also, I've read about just the attachment is also one of the causes of, uh, in Buddhist language, suffering. You know, you, you suffer because you're attached. Um, and if you, something, if something, whatever you're attached to does not work out the way that you want it to, or the person leaves or dies, you know, a loved one, or you lose a job or whatever, you've been attached to those things and then so, and that causes suffering. But if you just say, look, okay, I lost that job, another one will come. Yeah. And you, know, you, let, you just let go and you believe that the universe has plenty to offer you and that um, you know, another opportunity will come your way. And so exactly. I, I, I love that. I, I'm so glad I asked you that question and you got into the, the attachment thing and closely related to that, like I said, is, is ego is getting yeah exactly so yeah. so remember i spoke a bit back about tapping into the universal consciousness what the universal consciousness is is the opposite of getting attached to your ego mm. so the moment you say that i got denied that promotion 
if you ask who got denied that promotion and then you'll realize that your ego got denied that promotion but the consciousness the consciousness couldn't care less about the promotion and the consciousness is probably laughing at the ego for like this this is some sort of a universal joke that yes. well i look what i did i fooled you again yes. sort of a thing um and look these are really difficult philosophies to get into and probably i'm not someone who is a uh, deepak chopra for example who's very eloquent in describing all of this yes. um but um the the eastern philosophies and i i tend to not call them religions i tend to call them philosophies yes. because they are actually philosophies for life yes. and what you'll see if you actually go into the logic of them all is that they are very very logically coherent um and stuff that uh, i think um you know psychologists neuroscientists and um people like i don't know that there's there there's a whole debate about consciousness these days it's fashionable to debate about consciousness um so philosophers like daniel dennett uh, david chalmers these these guys are big in their own fields and they are talking and debating about these things till now so yeah, yeah. it's and there are very very close similarities to the uh, texts that we have um in the subcontinent for over well over 10000 years probably so wow yeah. yeah yeah absolutely and and i just want to reiterate as well you know we're not making light of um you know of of sometimes this is really hard you know as you said sujeshna you know certainly if if there's a a parent who um is living in poverty uh and wondering how they're going to put food on the table um for their children it may be very difficult for them at that moment at that moment to think the universe is abundant that's mm -hmm. hard it's harder for them to think to think that because they're dealing with the reality that's right in front of them and and there's fear there there's fear that there is not enough and so it would be easy for you know for me to say or anyone to say well you know i want you to think about the universe as abundant it's coming to you um and but in the reality that they're they're faced with their present circumstance so i i just want to say i know this is not always easy and sudeshna you've said that as well it's not always easy to be in the flow of an abundant universe and an abundant psyche um but as as often as you can even when you are in dire circumstances even when you have not gotten the job that you want or um money is running low in the bank or you the relationship that you counted on is is not working out or whatever even during those circumstances you know try to step back try to get out of the ego try to uh operate a little bit on faith cuz that's the spirituality side right is that we sometimes don't have a rational or logical answer we just have to believe that the universe is abundant and then watch how it operates to bring resources um to us so i thought i'd just say that before we um moved on um so now you have a gift for listeners so if you are a listener or a viewer and you hung in there good for you cuz now sudeshna is going to tell you a little bit about a gift that she said she wanted to offer to your aha life listeners so what do you have what do you have sudeshna yeah so this is the practical aspect of the abundant psyche and we spoke briefly about that about uh, how hormones and um, neuroscience actually affects our uh, confidence and our systems so in this particular document that i'm uh, going to put up on 
theabundantpsyche.com your raha life uh, so uh, tonya you link down uh, yeah i'll the... put the link in the show notes um so you'll make sure i have the correct link and i'll definitely put it in there yeah. for people to to use it to tap into it yeah brilliant so yeah that uh, that's where i have kind of gone down and shared a bit more about the psychological triggers that hormones have on us and how we can proactively manage these hormones um breath work for example there are poses so all of those things are listed down in a nice way as uh, a document so grab that there are postures shown and so on so yeah thank you that's what it is that's pretty cool so we'll learn a little bit of the biorhythms of abundance of an abundance mindset right the bio i call i call it the biochemistry because uh, biochemistry. yeah okay. uh, yeah because because hormones and yeah they, that's that's basically chemistry in our yeah. body and we can so, sort of hack the biochemistry in some ways so yeah. yeah that's pretty cool thank you for that i know i'm going to enjoy it and i know my Brilliant. listeners and viewers will as well so we're at the point in the show Sudeshna where I get to ask the final question that I ask of all of my guests as you know this is your aha life and um, I believe the aha life is an enlightened life we're talking about consciousness right it's an enlightened life that leads to more joy and more purpose and more fulfillment but what that looks like for everyone is you know, can be very different and is as unique to as you are. And so I'd love for you to share what does the aha life mean to you? And how are you living your aha life? So my aha life is actually uh, where I get to have fun. I get to serve people. And I get enough of time for my spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think how I'm serving people is through the abundant psyche. And also, of course, my corporate job, that is service as well to my, um, to my employer, my shareholders and everyone else. Um, how I'm having fun. Well, I, I better have fun doing all of this service if I have to kind of think, oh my God, I have to, you know, wake up and speak to uh, 10,000 people. No, that's, that's, that's not going to be fun. And that's not stepping into abundance. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's why I think fun is an important aspect of my life and uh, enough time for a spiritual practice. So I make sure that, um, I have time to sit and meditate every day and, uh, you know, uh, probably read something or the other or listen to something that at least keeps your uh, energies at a level that are not too depressing. Yeah. Oh, um, so much going so, on, right? Yeah. 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 So like you have to find a way to keep your mind above all of this. And um, if I, if I literally, I think, if I see myself procrastinating for more than two to three days on something, I take note of that and figure out what on earth is wrong uh, because procrastination is actually very good feedback. So, so yeah, that's, that's me. I think that's a the, whole the nother, that's a of, whole nother show. Yeah. Suggestion. Yeah. That's, that's a whole another show. Yeah. Procrastination Absolutely. because that's something I'm really interested in. Cause I find myself, like you said, procrastination is feedback. Because I find myself procrastinating sometimes or around the writing of my book. Mm. And, um, and I think there's more to it. You know, there's something underneath that, that, mm. I'm, I, that it's feedback for me. There's something that I'm avoiding when yeah. I procrastinate. But that, like I say, that's a whole nother yeah, show. That we'll is, do that next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's my aha life. Your aha life. It's fun. It's serving others and it is spiritual, spirituality. So I yep. love it. So Sudeshna, thank you so much for joining me on your aha life today. I, um, I love what we talked about. I'm going to put it into practice myself. I'm going to see myself as a writer, as a published writer, and, and operate as like I'm a published uh, 
writer and public, I'm a book author. So yeah. Um, so more to come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tonya, for having me and all the best with your book. I'm oh, excited. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Tanya Harris Cornelius. Come back again in another couple of weeks for a brand new episode. Hit the subscribe button and I'll see you soon.